So I want to get started today. I'm really excited to uh, introduce Xenatol Furtis. She is a postdoc that joined the Ag Station in what, 2020, December of 2020, um, on on a project that uh, Phil and I have been working on, um, looking at the role of how multiple blood meals can um, alter the course of viral infection in mosquitoes. And so she's been working on that since she's been here. She originally got her degree, her undergraduate degree from the University of Dhaka in 2004, and then went on and got her master's from University of Dhaka as well. So she's from Bangladesh, if you don't know where Dhaka is, she's, she's from Bangladesh, and um, got her master's in 2006 from um, Dhaka as well. And then she went on to uh, University of Leicester in uh, England and got her master's there in 2008, and then subsequently went and did her PhD in um, George Christofferty's lab at the Imperial College of London, looking at the role of lipids during um, mosquito sort of reproduction and um, survival. And, um, and then she moved here to the States after she got her PhD and was working, well, she was down in DC. Um, her husband uh, was doing work at the World Bank and uh, she was down there doing some teaching. Uh, was it Trinity, Trinity College? So she was doing an adjunct position at Trinity College, but was kind of out of research. And uh, when she saw this job opportunity here, she really want, wanted the, the opportunity to come back and start doing research in the laboratory and, and stuff like that and the change. And so that's how we were uh, fortunate enough to be able to, to get Xanatol to join us. And then, however, just as soon as we got her, um, we just found out 10 minutes ago that she was offered a position at Sacred Heart as a uh, assistant professor at Sacred Heart University. So um hopefully well, well we'll see um decisions have to be made on what happens and um whatever it is i think sacred heart has made a good choice so without further ado i'd like to introduce xanatol so make sure that the, no, but now the camera to, uh sorry uh how to just share like people can sh see my can they see it on the my, okay yeah Thank you so much, Doug, for this wonderful introduction. Um, since I just got the news, I'm kind of excited. So if that excitement makes an interruption in my uh, presentation, please forgive me. Um, okay, um, so um, today I'm going to talk about the uh, vector competence, uh, the influencer of vector competence uh, in mosquitoes. So. Uh, before I start my talk, I just uh, want to tell you what is vector competence. So mosquitoes, the percentage of the mosquitoes that acquire and transmit pathogens, uh, that is called vector competence. So it is all about like how this blood feeding behavior and gut microbiota composition uh, modulates this vector competence in mosquitoes. We are going to talk about that. It's not. It's no. Yeah, but now it's not. It's off. Yeah, it's on. Okay. You can do it this way. Which way? Um, you just hit this button. Oh, okay. Sorry, not sure. spoil. Okay. Not yeah. Uh, so it's a kind of outline of my work, uh, the today's talk. So um, I know that uh, some of you uh, do not know much about mosquitoes. So I will try to uh, give you some information, some basic information about mosquito and uh, vectors interaction, uh, mosquito and virus interactions. And also I will talk a little, uh, little about my rationale of my research. Um, and then I will discuss about two of my projects. So I initially, uh, Doug hired me for the first project where I tried to find out the multiple blood, how these multiple blood meals enhance the transmission of uh, 
transmission of herbal viruses in uh, mosquitoes, like two mosquitoes. Um, and then um, at some point, Doug involved me in another project where we tried to find out uh, like how the micro, what is the role of the microbiome uh, of mosquito um, in vectorial uh, comp uh, competence using exonic mosquitoes. Uh, those who do not know what is exonic mosquito, I will come, uh, I will explain it to you uh, after some time. So just bear with me. So the first thing first, some basics. So uh, most of you uh, know that mosquito borne, there are some mosquito borne diseases are around and they are really concerning. Uh, one of uh, mostly like Zika and uh, West Nile virus and dengue, they are increasing in, especially in states. Uh, otherwise, malaria, yellow fever, and the other uh, virus borne diseases, they are really concerning. Uh, so why they are so, uh, why this is the reason of our concern? Um, you can see that they are the deadliest animal in the world. Uh, even they, uh, the death by humans, they exceed the uh, death by humans, um, you can see. Um, and so one thing uh, you need to remember throughout the seminar that uh, there are some specificity, specificity between uh, mosquitoes and virus or like pathogens. Uh, not all the mosquitoes can be infected by uh, the same virus uh, and vice versa. So you can see that for the malaria, uh, usually plasmodium, the parasite, it when it infects the anopheles and it goes to human, it causes malaria. And chikungunya, dengue virus, uh, dengue fever, West Nile fever, these are all caused by viruses. And uh, mostly, a uh, study shows that they uh, they carried by Aedes mosquitoes. So a little bit of how these mosquitoes uh, get infected and how they transmit the virus. Um, so you can see when the mosquito ingest or feed on an infected uh, human, this infected blood directly goes to the midgut lumen and there they replicates, I won't go to very deep. I'll just telling you like the overview. So go to the mid gut and then they replicate and somehow they escape the gut. This is the gut and you can see that this gut has two layers. One is called the, the, the inner one is mid gut epithelium. The outer one is basal lamina. They somehow they escape that and then that virus goes to the hemolymph that is the circulatory system of the mosquito and from there they go to secondary tissues for example fat bodies muscles and at some point they end up to the salivary gland that is their goal and when they are in the salivary gland if that mosquito bite another human through their saliva this virus go to that new person and that's how they transmit Um, and this figure is showing that the way this is increasing, uh, you can see that Zika and Dengue is really spreading. They are emerging in America. And malaria, you can see that the distribution is almost in all the uh, continents. Uh, and uh, the other, uh, like, I told you like dengue and Zika are most uh, important for us, uh, especially considering the states now. So they're emerging and they're spreading. So what we usually do, the first thing we do, the chemical, we use the major, the bigger part is we use chemical insecticides as a control method. But the problem of this uh, that Currently, this figure is showing that the way the insecticide resistance is increasing. And you can see that in 
uh, Asia, it is almost like red. So the insecticide resistance is too high because they started insecticides uh, like before uh, from very early of the like, century and that's how they get this uh, resistance. And also though you can see that there is not enough resistance are recorded in uh, America, but it's, it looks like that it's growing. So this is really a uh, important issue or burning issue now. So in that case, uh, and also the other thing I want to mention that the, especially those diseases uh, that um, caused by virus like dengue or chikungunya or West Nile uh, fever, they do not have any vaccine. And you can see in this figure that uh, one company from Manila, they claimed that they have dengue vaccine, but when the people started using it, uh, some people died. So actually they are protesting here. Um, and also you can see that there is not enough vaccine. So all these issues are actually driving us uh, to think about uh, differently, to find out different methods. So you can see that in this figure, the uh, author tried to give us some uh, like ways or indications like that way we can go to find out a new um, uh, control method. Uh, in this, all these are kind of like different strategies, but my research focuses are, I am trying to develop a new tool, uh, controlling mosquito controlling tool. And also uh, I'm, I am involved in vector competence studies because vector competence, I will show you just uh, like minute, uh, minute uh, that this vector competence is really important uh, from epidemiological view. Point. So, when I uh, like came to case um, this station, um, I actually focuses on this part. So first, I tried. I already told you that I tried to see that how this uh, frequent blood feeding of mosquito behavior influences the uh, virus dissemination. Um, as well as I told you that microbiota composition, what is the impact of that on virus transmission? So let's start my first project. Um, you can see that those wonderful people who really guided me, uh, supported me um, scientifically and morally. And there are a lot of people there, like they always supported me morally. I feel really uh, comfortable and uh, safe in the lab. So I really want to say thank you to all of my lab mates. Um, so all were involved in this project. Um, so first, why, um, what is, how mosquitoes survive? So they definitely feed on something, right? Uh, so mosquitoes can feed on sugar, like, you know, honey, and they go to the like flowers and they collect uh, honey from there, like sugars, uh, and also they feed on mosquito, uh, sorry, uh, human for blood. So why? They could have just feed on sugar, why they want this blood. So this is the uh, life cycle of mosquito. You can see that um, this female mosquito, only f uh, most of the cases, the only female mosquito feed on blood and then it lays egg, uh, and the other part of their life cycle, right? So we will focus, my research will focus this part. So what happened in this part? Female mosquito feed and that blood actually provide the nutrition for egg development. How? So uh, one research found that almost 10% of the uh, human blood amino acid, uh, like human meal amino acid carbon goes to the um, egg in the form of lipid and protein. 6% uh, of the carbon molecule that converts or th that forms uh, protein, uh, sorry, lipid, and 
six percent, four percent is uh, protein and six percent lipid. Uh, they store in the egg as a lipid form. So it's kind of, we can think like why we eat several times. So similarly, uh, what drives mosquito in nature to feed frequently or what actually they do? So you can see from the outer side that after having blood ingestion and digestion, egg matures and from there they lay eggs and that's how their cycle goes on and on. But sometimes it happens like mosquito can't get blood properly. So like they, have, they can't have the full meal. So it can be, the reason might be like outer any force. Sometimes it happened like, oh, I, it's biting me. So you can just hush, 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 and then it's go. So it can't finish its whole cycle, whole feeding. So it's still thirsty. And that mosquito again, try to find another host. Similarly, if the mosquito find that their egg maturation is not enough, then again, they want to go and have some blood and they try to find, uh, you know, like host. And other thing is poor nutrition. Sometimes it happens that uh, the blood they get, that is not enough, uh, that doesn't have enough lipid in it because mosquito cannot produce uh, high density lipoprotein inside like the, uh, so that's why our cholesterol, they can't pre produce the cholesterol inside. So they need to have the cholesterol from the outside host. So if they find that the host they already had, that that host didn't have enough cholesterol, then they again try to find another host. So that's how they find uh, their hosts. So one study has found that these urban dwelling edisagitae, it fits predominantly and frequently on human. And uh, the other study, they actually reported that every day in nature, they have 0 0.7 blood meal. So it means like not full. So you can already see that it's kind of uh, below their uh, full uh, blood meal. So actually then what happened? So uh, here you can see one term I used, gonotropic cycle. So that means from, have, from seeking the host to laying the eggs, the whole process is called gonotropic cycle. So usually it takes three days time. Uh, so, you know, like for these three days, they actually frequently find uh, the host and just go and bite. So that's why it is a kind of a consequence. It means that the this mosquito is getting contact with host more and more. That contact is increasing. So now it's a little bit of again vector um, capacity. So I told you about vector competence. Uh, not vector capacity. So vector capacity is uh, very important uh, in, uh, it calls like the ability of a mosquito to serve as a disease vector. And this equation, you can see, this is important uh, to find out that how robust will be the endemic or epidemic this year. So this sort of forecast, we need this uh, equation. And all these, uh, thing, you can see all are the components which are actually influence this vectorial capacity. What are these one? You can see that vector competence, vector biting rate, vector density, and uh, probability of vector daily survival, and so on. The problem, so you understand that definitely people did studies and got this information. The problem is all these uh, experiments, they, in the lab, they only fed those mosquito once, single time. So 
this doesn't match with the nature because we already know that mosquito feeds several times in the nature. And since they, they have to just remember, just uh, try to like see that uh, equation, there is a point of vector, vectorial um, com competence for the vectorial capacity. So if we put one there, my, the value one, instead of two or nine, definitely the value is very lower than the actual one. So that actually gave us the wrong number so far. So, so far, we all know why mosquitoes have blood and why, how many times or like how frequent they are in the nature. Now we will focus the reserve, on the reservoir. So I already told you that this blood usually straight goes to the uh, gut, mosquito gut, right? So we, here I tried to show you uh, like, is it, really easy for a virus to replicate in the mosquito? No, because there are some barriers for them. This is not so easy. So the first barrier you can see that the gut, so gut has epithelial uh, tissue and basal lamina. So the virus has to cross that line to get into the other tissues, right? And there is another bottleneck you can tell that is uh, salivary gland. So there are some bottlenecks where these virus get resistance. I'm not talking about the immunity here, just think about the mechanical stuff. So, the major barrier for the mosquito is the gut. So, since this is the major, we, I am going to focus on the structure of the gut. So you can see that this is the unfed mosquito and this is the fed mosquito. Uh, just fed. So it is kind of three times of its body size. So since it is like three times of the body size, it means that the, there's mechanical distension of the gut. So if something like uh, expand, we can think that there might be some micro perforation, uh, formation, yeah, perforation. So yes, there is some micro perforation. Not only that, after blood feeding, mosquito uh, gut has some remodeling. Uh, so how, how do that happen? Sometimes our apoptosis and regeneration of the mid-gut epithelial cell. And that's how it actually altered the basal lamina. So now maybe you forgot that what is the basal lamina? We are going to talk about that now. Uh, just remember one thing that all these experiments, all these findings are based on single feed experiments. So uh, in 2020, uh, Doug and Phil showed that uh, after 24 hours of blood feeding, mosquito has micro perforation. But this is held in 72 hours of blood feeding. So why this is important, um, you can easily link up later on. So just again, uh, to give you the view of the location, the positioning of the basal lamina, you can see the outer side of that uh, yellow layer is the basal lamina and inside the epithelial cell, the yellow one, and then the gut lumen. Uh, this is a nice but a complicated figure. Uh, this is the basal lamina. Okay, so basal lamina, what is basal lamina? So if you see the gut, the outer part of the gut is enclosed by a basal lamina. And basal lamina is a uh, um, non-cellular uh, layer of uh, polysaccharide, uh, mu mucin polysaccharide and uh, polyglycan, it actually supports the gut, the epithelial cells, overlying epithelial cells, and also it, it acts as a mesh. You can see that this kind of a mesh shape, so it serves as a filter of some uh, micronutrients and 
uh, hormones. So the size of this uh, mesh, or you can like ports, this is only 10 nanometer. Uh, so problem is the virus we're talking about now, those arboviruses, they're much bigger than that 10 nanometer pore size. So you can see that from flyvirus 45 to bunny virus 100 nanometers. So how they're crossing this uh, layer. Uh, so it is very, uh, I already explained like this is likely that they can't cross, these viruses can't cross. So at that time, actually, uh, Doug and Phil, they were trying to understand the role of the double feeding because they are, you already know that they are healing at some point and they make the micro perforation. Uh, so is it possible that again, the mosquito is having blood and that is happening repeatedly? Uh, in 2022, Doug and Phil, they published a paper where they showed that uh, in Zika virus, Zika and Aedes aegypti pairing, uh, these double feeding, because they fed those mosquitoes twice and they found that that increased the dissemination of rate of the virus. Similarly, they tried with different uh, virus and different mosquito, but from the same genera, it is Albopictus and Dengue, and they got the similar result. You can see that, uh, by the way, uh, so DI is the dissemination. So dissemination means, so when the mosquito feed the virus, not all the mosquitoes get infected. Some of them infected. So of those, some of the infect, infected mosquitoes, some of them actually uh, get their virus in their saliva or in the other tissues. So that is called dissemination, the percentage. Uh, from their that finding, they actually develop a mod model. And you can see this model is saying that when the mosquito is having only one blood meal, they have a, like very, uh, compared to the below one, the tiny micro perforation. But when they're having double feed or like twice, you can see that they have more uh, pores or perforation. So it means that then the virus get more access to get out, to get escape the gut. So, but uh, they were also thinking that they used some specific pairing, right? Zika and Aedes or Dengue or Aedes. But we, I already told you uh, in my, uh, like initially that they have some specificity. Then what actually happened? Like there are a lot of pairings of mosquitoes, right? are all they follow this rule or this is not. So they got uh, R01, a fund, and from then they hired me. When I came here, I just modified their uh, methods and I, I'll just explain the methods. You can see that initial infection, so we infected the mosquitoes with arbovirus. After three days, we feed one group of mosquitoes from there uh, with non-infectious blood. And there is another group that is just single feed. And after that, we harvested them on day six, eight, and 10. And we did some QPCR to see the uh, vector competence of the mosquitoes. One thing I just want to mention, why three days? Because we know that after 72 days, uh, 72 hours, the gut, actually start healing or it's almost healed the process, healed their gut. So we want to see like if double feed has any impact after that. Uh, so this is my work and I started with different pairs. So one pair, first pair I worked with that was Aedes aegypti and alpha virus of uh, generals. One is uh, myrovirus. We took myrovirus because uh, these are kind of emerging virus. We don't know much about it, but they have symptoms similar to dengue. So it's good to uh, use them. Uh, and you can see the size of them. And 
On the right side, uh, here I just put a, one leg because for the dissemination, our lab proved that instead of salivary gland or saliva, we can still use legs to see the dissemination. Uh, and here uh, you can see that on day six and day eight, the dissemination rate was significant. So it looks like for this pair, it's working. What about the other pairs? So other pair is the other pair we work with Anopheles quadrimaculatus and Anopheles myrovirus, the same virus. And we again find the trend. You can see that day six and day eight showed significant dissemination rate. Uh, again, the other mosquito, Qlex quenquifaciatus and virus with West Nile virus. And you can see the virus size is definitely smaller than the before. And again, we found some uh, positive result here. It's working here as well. Finally, we were thinking like, okay, we have a window of um, size of the virus. Can we go out of that? They just grab some bigger one. So we actually took one bigger, which is 9,200 nanometers, uh, the bunny virus. Um, one of the example of the bunny virus is lacros virus. So we worked with lacros virus too. And you can see that it showed uh, significance in day six, day eight, and day 10. Uh, here, I just want to mention because I just switched the color. So for the blue one, actually that is the double feed and the red one, the single feed. So from there, um, if I summarize the thing, then you can see that so far we worked with three mosquito genera, Aedes, Anopheles, and Culex, and three virus genera, Flavivirus, Alphavirus, and Bunnivirus. And vector competence, it looks like that vector competence of our virus associated with sequential blood feeding, it is generalizable across all the arbovirus vector we worked with. Okay. So you can take a breath. I have done with my first project. Let's go to the second project. Uh, so here, those wonderful people. So I didn't mention about these two people because they were not, they are outside of our lab, but still they are kind of very close to our lab and we work always in our collaboration. So bacteria. We all know that our gut has bacteria. Similarly, the virus, uh, sorry, the uh, mosquito, that has uh, bacteria too. So how do they get these bacteria, these mosquitoes? Actually, when they lay eggs in the water, from there, that water surface, they get the bacteria and actually they carry those bacteria to, towards their adulthood. Um, so we can, tell that this acquisition of microbiota is habitat dependent. Uh, these are kind of, uh, we don't need to read out anything or just look, it's, it's just to show like how many uh, bacteria can be, the thousands, very big number, but they are the most abundant one like Asia, Bacillus and so on, okay? So again, the same figure. Uh, you can see these, uh, uh, this element of the vector capacity equation. So why I put this antibiotics? Because I told you uh, that those are single feed experiment as well as they actually cleared the bacteria. They tried to clear the bacteria from the gut using these uh, antibiotics. Uh, why? Because at that time, there was no other option available there. So that was the only option. And people uh, were kind of convinced that they cleared the microbiota from the gut. What is the problem of that? The first problem is when we try to clear the bacteria of the gut using antibiotic, it actually doesn't clear the bacteria. Instead of uh, clearing, it causes dysbiosis. It means that it changes the composition of the bacteria rather than clearing the bacteria. So you can see here that the, when you use one 
antibiotic, it decreases the azea and I can read it, sorry. Uh, so apart from that, so is this the only problem? There is another, uh, another problem. So recently, just a year ago, uh, one group has uh, published one paper that they showed that in mammalian model, uh, the antibiotic shows sort of uh, modulation in their immunity and their metabolism. So on basis of that, just keep that in your mind. Just we are going to 2012 and see what those people did. That time, uh, Domopoulos group, they published two papers. There they actually tried to make a connection with uh, dengue virus transmission and the microbiota of the mosquito gut. And they uh, found that uh, these microbiota uh, is microbiota influences the uh, virus transmission. Problem is, they also use the antibiotic. So they actually, so it is very difficult to know whether this transmission was influenced by the microbiota composition of the gut, or that is the reason or impact of the sustained antibiotic exposure. So how we can figure that out? So definitely we need something sterile, uh, any sterile system. Luckily at that time, our lab, they actually developed exonic mosquitoes, it is Egypti. It means that the mosquito doesn't have any bacteria, right? So they developed that tool for us. So then we got the uh, empty template. So we tried to play with that. So we decided to compare the vector competence of exonic mosquitoes and antibiotic treated mosquitoes. And also we wanted to find out if uh, antibiotic exposure has any impact on the mosquito transcriptome like the mammalian model. This is the uh, workflow. You can see that I had uh, two sets of mosquitoes, exonic mosquitoes and colony mosquitoes, but we separated those two uh, colony mosquitoes to two groups. One had streptomycin, gentamicin, and penicillin, and another group, they didn't get anything. So when I say colony mosquitoes, you just remember that that is undisturbed microbiota. When I say uh, antibiotic treated mosquitoes, so you remember that that is dysbiosis. And when I say exonic mosquitoes, no bacteria at all. And you can see that uh, we actually exposed the mosquito uh, for three days with antibiotic. And after that, we infected them with uh, infected bloods. And we continue another three days with the uh, antibiotic exposure for the antibiotic group. But the other two, they were on only sucrose. And finally, we separated the gut and whole body and we tried to see the vector competence or dissemination as well as the, um, the titer of the virus in there. So definitely any, anyone can ask like, okay, you are telling this exonic mosquito is it? So for that reason, we actually did some PCR uh, with 16S. And you can see that this is so clear here in exonic mosquito, but you can see the band in antibiotic treatment and colony. So this also suggests that antibiotic doesn't clear the microbiota completely. Okay, so now the, uh, the main results. So in the mid gut, you can see that there is no dissemination um, in the, mid-gut infection, when you see, we saw that in antibiotic-treated group, the infection rate, rate is significantly higher than other two groups. Then we wanted to know about the titer. So here also we can see that the antibiotic treatment group has higher virus titer compared to the colony. And this is for the body, and we can see the similar trend here as well. 
Um, this is with chicks. So I didn't mention you, sorry. Uh, we, that time we used dengue virus and this time we used chikungunya virus. And interestingly, you can see that we, uh, it's kind of a switch. Uh, so you can see that the highest dissemination was in colony mosquitoes compared to other two. And what about their, um, and you can see that their titer in the gut was not significant and in the body, it is also not significant. So the question is like, why in the microbiota treated mosquito shows this high dissemination of virus? So there might be two possibilities. One, the mid gut microbiota composition might play a role or mosquito response due to antibiotic treatment. Maybe antibiotic has its own impact on the physiology of the mosquito. So first we tried to figure out the composition of the mosquito, uh, mid gut uh, microbiome. So for that one, you can see that for the colony mosquito, we extracted DNA and from there we just did some sequencing. Interestingly, and we are very excited about that, you can see the completely two different composition of the bacteria in control and antibiotic treated mosquitoes. So it is clear that this antibiotic treatment changes the composition of the mosquito uh, microbiome. You can see there specifically, we, we saw the variation in proteobacteria, actinobacteria and fumicutes. These are the phylum. So uh, we tried to do some analysis to see the significance, this different significance. And you can see that SCE analysis is showing that this is highly significant. And also you can see the trend, like they are uh, accumulating or uh, they're making groups, right? So this is the control group and this is the antibiotic group. Um, Shannon analysis is more strict than SE, so we also perform that one to see our result, and here we also see this difference is significant. So, yes, antibiotic treatment has, significant, has significantly changed the microbiome structure in the mosquito gut. Now we wanted to see like, okay, we know that, but what about antibiotic? What is doing there? Um, so for that one, actually what we did, uh, you can see that there are two groups of colony mosquitoes, antibiotic, we treated antibiotic and we didn't treat with antibiotic one group. There's another in exenic, the similarly antibiotic plus and antibiotic minus and then RNA extraction and finally the sequencing. We didn't see any significant difference in trans transcriptomic expression in antibiotic uh, mosquitoes. So in the left side with PC1, uh, this principal component analysis is showing that, no, they're not showing any trend. Uh, and the right side, you can see these are the genes plot and there is no significant or upregulation or downregulation of any gene. So is it, Anyone can ask like, oh, maybe this is the just error of your um, analysis, but it's not like that because before uh, uh, our lab uh, with collaboration with Blair, uh, they already showed that actually in exenic mosquitoes, uh, the microbiota has really very little impact on the uh, transcriptomes. So we can tell that this is definitely the result. So from there, we can tell that anti antibiotic treatment has no significant impact on mosquito transcriptome. Then uh, what is the message then? So since we wanted to separate the two group, uh, now we know, uh, one was the composition, the structure variation in the mid gut. The other was the impact of the antibiotic. Uh, we didn't find any impact of the antibiotic on the mosquito, the antibiotic exposure on the mosquito. So we can tell that this virus transmission is uh, impacted by the variation of the composition of the mosquito microbiome. Um, yeah, 
So that's it. Thank you so much. And floor is yours. If you have questions, you can ask. Yeah. Uh, so we showed that uh, uh, upper multiple blood fields, uh, the dot uh, uh, structure have uh, some form, and which helps the, the virus to escape into the, the, the You will see. Uh, yeah, so the grand, grand, uh, granular uh, area. So then we can promote the transmission. I wonder if um, having more blood in the dot um, compared Uh, okay, if I understand your question, the question is like, if there is more blood, it means more virus replication and more leaking? Uh, like, uh, like, the conclusion is more on the uh, having more blood meals to make the, the gut uh, stretched out so the virus can leak, leak through better. But I'm wondering, in addition to this uh, uh, mechanism, does, does having more blood in the mid gut also help the virus to? Uh, so actually blood doesn't have any impact that uh, as such because what happened blood is just the carrier of the virus and when virus is kind of just think about uh, like ball the ball has a uh, like a uh, lot of uh, small small balls there and all the water so water is the uh, your blood and those balls are the virus so not all the viruses are the near the uh, that big ball, the side of the ball. So those virus who are near the side of the ball, they can actually go inside the, uh, the epithelial cell and inside the epithelial cell, they actually multiply. So like blood actually doesn't have any impact, but if the blood has high cholesterol, it means that the plasma membrane of the cell, it has more cholesterol in it and that when the virus is inside the epithelial cell, it can replicate more. Yeah, and Juan, just to follow up, I mean, we did look at that in our first paper where we looked at virus titer in those mosquitoes about a second blood meal. And we saw no increase in virus titer. So it's not an issue where you're providing more nutrients and a lot of the virus to replicate the higher level. Well, yeah, it's really a mechanical perspective. Yeah. I have a question regarding the type of virus. So you mentioned there's no difference in the transcription between the transcription and the virus, right? Yeah. Uh, but that in on-site materials, if you look at what happens if they are fed, like blood cells, should I say that the transcription is still the same? Uh, we didn't check. We didn't try that. Yeah. Uh, first of all, nice presentation. Thank you for being on it. I'd like to uh, ask a follow up question, maybe if I want to use a last one. Uh, so, for the field and development model, you know, you're proposing more like a mechanical uh, type of treatment of virus. I wonder if there is any physical separate in the molecule that was a So that's what we're trying to find out with um, what's the name? So um, with another group. So there we are trying to see like if hemocytes uh, has any uh, involvement in the virus transmission. Uh, so we don't know yet. I mean, did I answer your question or I didn't understand? I mean, you can ex you can ask again. Yeah, it was a very interesting because there is a system similar system that can replicate the virus and 
But we, I, I don't think that uh, in the mosquito we know. No. Thank you.